Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So I am utterly shocked to see this many people at a movie about a mathematician on a Monday night. Um, very happy to see you all here. It, it's fantastic. Um, also happy, I mean, I see many mathematicians, aspiring mathematicians and students of mathematics in the audience. I also see many completely unfamiliar faces, which is great too. Um, so before I introduce the film, I want to mention two things. One is that we do have a panel discussion afterwards. Um, panelists are myself, David Fisher, in the math department, my colleague Michael Larson in the math department, Susan Sizer from Anthropology, and Helen Linden Strauss, who is visiting us from Jerusalem. Um, in addition to the panel discussion, there's one other thing you might want to check out other than the movie and the cinema, which is the library has a table by the bathrooms in the basement with a collection of books related to the film on it. Um, and so if you have a moment, you know, after the movie, after the panel, and want to check that out, that, you're also welcome to do that. Um, so, um, I think most of my colleagues in the math department would agree that it is very rare to think of mathematics or doing mathematics as something filmic. What we do is very abstract and internal. A mathematician deep in thought might look like a person daydreaming or even asleep. You know, at its most visually vivid, doing mathematics is someone furiously scribbling on a legal pad or a chalkboard or looks simply like a very excited conversation between friends. As such, celebrations of mathematics on film are rare and tend to focus on the personal over the intellectual. Um, and we are also a community of introverts. I, one of my favorite jokes about mathematicians is, how do you tell the extroverted mathematician? They're looking at your shoes. <laughs> um, 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 we're really not that bad. But, so even our personal lives rarely seem to be worthy of, of, of you know, being captured on film. The story of Ramanujan, on the other hand, is a largely self-educated mathematician whose life story intersects with colonialism and white privilege and exotic travel and all kinds of other things in very unusual ways. Um, and his life story was exceptional and unusual, and so was his mathematics. Um, and like all truly notable mathematicians of the past, Ramanujan not only has a number of his own discoveries named after him, but there are a number of objects that weren't discovered till long after his death that are also named after him. His impact is tremendous in that way. Um, and his contribution to mathematics may sort of be the best evidence that cultural background affects the flavor of mathematics one produces because both his background and his work are quite in and syncretic. I, you know, I hope you both enjoy the film and walk away from it intrigued enough to want to know a little bit more about not just his life, but what he actually did. With that. I think we're going to start out by just going down the table and having people say any particular thoughts they have about the movie up here, and then we'll take your questions and thoughts from, from out in the audience afterwards. So um, does anyone want to start? Sure. Uh, does, does this work? So, I mean, one of the things about this story, maybe the about the story that, as a math mathematician, most strikes me is how well uh, Hardy behaved in this uh, story. I, I know it may not seem like that to the non-mathematicians, but to receive a, a letter from somebody in the middle of nowhere with no professional qualifications uh, claiming to have solved an important problem in mathematics is not unusual at all. In fact, it's a, a very common occurrence. Uh, to read the letter, to recognize in the letter something extraordinary, uh, that requires a certain very unusual kind of person, I think. And I think it's greatly to Hardy's credit. He was not the first person that uh, Ramanujan wrote to, but he was the first person who recognized that this was really something extraordinary. They gave us three microphones to four people, but I guess we'll manage. So, one thing which is, I mean, there's several movies in popular movies about mathematicians. This one is somehow by far 
the most uh, the most accurate in description of mathematics. Of course, there are some. Uh, it's not quite uh, authentic, but there's a few things you see in this movie that are quite uh, that are extremely true. So one of the things you see is that okay, mathematicians aren't perfect beings and the mathematical community isn't perfect, but it has this great advantage that when somebody actually does something remarkable, um, whatever, uh, this is uh, recognized and this is, uh, it is, doesn't take 30 years for people to get convinced that really whatever uh, mitochondria were initially um, were initially germs that somehow settled in a different uh, cell or something this you can when something remarkable happens you could get recognition no matter where you come from or who you are and that's the thing one of the nice things about mathematics Okay, I think I I am going to take a completely different take from the mathematical take. I, I found this heartbreaking. Um, I kept waiting for them to speak Tamil, and they were only speaking English, and it was driving me mad. Um, and also, he never ate the whole time, and I was so upset, and I was so upset by the portrayal of the mother as such a villi, uh, villain, um, keeping all the letters. So on an emotional level... Uh, I found it very difficult, but it also reminded me of a story in anthropology where the famous linguist Edward Zapir worked to the bone the last, um, a man named Ishi, the last Yahi, um, because he wanted to capture the language of the last Yahi speaker. And he kept him in, living in the museum um, for something probably like, I'm not, I'm not sure how... This was five years, but um, that may have only been a year. But he also died of tuberculosis. So it was very painful for me on so many levels. Um, uh, what else? I mean, Dev Patel gets every role, um, every good role for an Indian man, as if there are no other Indian men. Um, he's British, um, so he was faking his Engl Indian accent. And he's not even Tamil. Um, so. I mean, it was upsetting to me, this film. Um, you know, I appreciate hearing from the mathematicians that it was um, rigorously honest about the mathematical world, but it was brutal. I mean, they kept him in a freezing cold room and died of tuberculosis. He ate nothing, and his mother kept his letters. So that's all I have to say, I think. It's good that we should have some disagreement at the front of the room. It makes this more fun. Um, well, let me say a, a couple things myself before, before I take a question, which is um, so one thing I want to attempt to address that I don't think I can address quickly, and so you should feel free to ask more questions about it, is I do realize there are not a lot of people in this room without mathematical background. So without mathematical background, it seems like Hardy is simply torturing Ramanujan, which this notion of proof and rigor, which is you know counter to his inspiration, and trying to think of how you explain the role of proof in mathematics in, you know, 37 seconds at a table at the front of an audience like this. And I, I don't know that I can, but, you know, it's our version of checking things in a lab, of running experiments, of anything else, without which the whole discipline doesn't have a mode of functioning. And so, you know, I actually have... This, this is the legend of Ramana Yujan as it's told everywhere, where he was inspired but didn't, didn't know how to prove things. And I don't know if that's accurate, and I wish I did. Um, the other thing that sticks in my craw about this film a little bit is there's this um, frequent legend about mathematics and about many branches of academic work that one needs to be brilliant and inspired to do it well. And all I have to say is all the brilliant and inspired people I've known have gotten there through dint of also an awful lot of hard work. Um, and so I just want to say, particularly to the students in the room, that, you know, there are multiple roads to success and that, that, that you know, one, one doesn't need to be brilliant and inspired and intuitive in order to 
to contribute to this field or any other. Um, so with that, I'll take questions. Say something about that? So I'm not going to directly answer you or because there was no maybe because it was not a, a real question, but I would like to say something that's somehow related. I mean one of the things that sort of um, felt very personal to me in the film somehow this is a story that happened a long time ago in a country far, far away, but um, the relationship between a mentor and a, uh, the person who's being mentored is a very special uh, relationship, and it's sort of quite frightening to the advisor. So I have some graduate students. It's not exactly the same, I mean, it's, but it, it has some similarities, the relationship between an a graduate student and an advisor to the relation between Hardy and uh, Ramanujan. And it's uh, a frightening relationship. You want to be tough on the student. You want to make sure that she or he sort of uh, uh, does things like they should, etc. But you also want to make sure that, uh, first of all, you feel some responsibility to the person as a person, not just as a machine to produce mathematics. If someone of worry, you might not notice if your student somehow kind of not eating or something. So it's somehow, it's a very uh, intense relationship. And this this uh, movie was sort of depicting this in a very uh, interesting way, I think. Um, I think your, your analogy of a trellis is a really good one um, because it speaks to the colonial relationship, I mean, the structuring of, you know, the structuring of that racist relationship <laughs> was that we would not know, the world would not know of those mathematical discoveries without the support of, right, of that whole systemic world that has the prestige and power. So I, I think that's a good analogy, um, and, it's, and, it's, and it doesn't lessen the pain of it. Um, you know, the fact that he couldn't speak up. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, maybe it, it, it's in the mentor relationship, you know, that, that, that as a student he didn't feel he could say, you know, I can't eat anything with lard. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just so, so painful. The, ignorance on the British side um, of the realities of Indian life. Let me just say one thing about the um, mathematics of the situation. I mean, I think um, that the way that the movie portrayed it um, was maybe a little bit different from the, from the actual uh, mathematical relationship between, between uh, Hardy and uh, Ramanujan, uh, at least in the opinion of Littlewood, who wrote about this collaboration. And what he said 
uh, was that this result about the partition function, which was kind of the, the uh, partition function being the, the, the P of n that they were talking about, the number of ways of, of writing n as a sum, um, was uh, certainly the most important thing that Ramanujan did, and, and maybe arguably also the most important thing that Hardy did. Maybe not, but, but maybe. Um, what Littlewood said was that, that uh, proof really required the talents of both men, and that it showed both of them in their most characteristic mode of, of operating. And exactly what he meant by that, I'm not sure I understand. And to the extent that I think I understand it, I, I probably can't explain it uh, here. Um, but I, I think that um, it really was, in a certain sense, a collaboration of near equals who just had very complementary and very different um, sets of talent. And in that sense, it's a, it's a rather beautiful thing. I mean, I know there's a lot of ugliness. And this, this juxtaposition of, of the ugliness of the colonial relationship you're talking about and the beauty of the professional relationship that they have, is, I mean, I think that that's what makes it such a, an interesting story. And in a way, I mean, the transcendence and the discussion of transcendence and, and of God and of infinity, right, inhered in that part of the relationship. So we were asked what the significance was of a diagram that appeared twice in the film, once on a chalkboard and in a blackboard or black and white. I'm, I, I'm going to just repeat questions because people can't hear you. That, that. Anybody have a guess? I have no idea. Beats me. I think I know what they were aiming at, but I don't think they did it very well. There, there's something called the circle method. Um, yeah, I think that's what they were trying to hint at, yeah. I think you know more than I do. But... So, sure, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll use the example of the movie, right? So um, the idea is you want to break up some number, for example, four, into sums of um, positive integers, whole, whole numbers. And so you consider that three plus one is the same thing as one plus three. So you could have a single piece of size four, a three and a one, a two and a two, two, one, 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 one. Those are the ways you could do it. There are five ways. Uh, but if you can imagine doing the same thing with 100, there would be a lot more ways you could do it, hundreds of thousands of ways you could do it. And the a uh, remarkable thing, I mean, generally speaking, when you have uh, something like this which grows very rapidly, where there are many, many ways of doing uh, something, in this case, um, you wouldn't expect probably an exact formula. You, you would usually look for an approximate formula. And certainly that was the, this Major McMahon who kept on saying, no, he'll never do it, and so on. The idea was that that was kind of the, the uh, received opinion in the um, mathematical community at the time, that, that an exact formula was just not going to be possible. And certainly that's what Hardy believed. And Ramanujan from the beginning believed that an exact formula was possible. And uh, that was, I mean, in, in that sense, it was kind of this intuitive genius who saw, that, saw something that um, completely went against the grain of the experts in the field and who turned out to be right. Yes, yes, thank you for saying that, yes.
So we're being asked what we found surprising and given some suggestions of things that were surprising um, and that we might disagree about. And I don't know, anyone want to be surprised first? I'll take a crack at, at your question. So, I, I mean, I agree that on the surface, what Alone and I uh, were saying might, might seem um, contradictory or at least intention, as you put it. Uh, and I think that's true. Um, in a certain sense, the relationship between uh, Ramanujan and Hardy was like a, a relationship between an advisor and, and, and a student. Um, Ramanujan was an extraordinary, astonishing talent and so the relationship uh, ended up taking some very surprising turns. But as far as um, the question of recognizing um, work, um, you know, great work from unlikely sources, um, there are, I mean, of course, most work from unlikely sources is, is wrong. I mean, that's, that's, it's, I mean, uh, of the many letters that I've received, and, you know, um, as far as I can tell, they were all wrong. N none of them contained, a, of, this, of this, this category, none contained anything of value. So, okay, I mean, that's just the reality. Um, what, what can one say? I mean, uh, there, there, are, there have been some, some wonderful cases, and in fact, there was a, a um, movie that about a year ago uh, was screened here, which was in a certain sense a similar case. It was a man who had a PhD, but he was a, a, a lecturer at the University of New Hampshire who purported to solve a huge problem in analytic number theory. He submitted his paper to the top journal in the field. Within a couple of weeks, uh, it had been refereed, and the people said, yes, it's right. And I, I just want to add to clarify this. I've had a few papers of my own published in that journal. I've usually waited, uh, shall we say, more than one year, more than two years, more than three years to get a response. So they behaved exceptionally well. <laughs> yes. So, so I mean, I, 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 in that sense, I do agree with Alon that, that um, there is an opportunity for people who you know, not the, the Harvard professor who solves a big problem, but the, the you know, the person from uh, University of New Hampshire who claims to solve a big problem and who, who is listened to. That opportunity does exist. Um, I just want to say one thing I found surprising about the film before I take another question, and that is just, and I didn't feel they touched on it enough, but they just gave this impression that while his relationship was heart with Hardy may have been, you know, personally problematic and difficult, he seems to have, you know, acquired some number of friends among the students at Cambridge relatively quickly and easily. And I really would have liked to have seen more of, you know, only so much fits in two hours, but I would have liked to have seen more of that aspect of what, what life was really like for him in the moments when he wasn't in Hardy's room and wasn't in his own room. And, you know, we see him buy vegetables exactly once, um, like I just would have liked to have known more about what it was actually life for him to live in that in that setting. And, yeah. <laughs> so for those who didn't catch that, the, the question is, how does, how does the state of knowledge now, I guess, compared to what it was then, is there, is there much more known? Is there much less known? Do we know basically everything? Is it all solved? Should we all quit our jobs and go home? Um, I, 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 I will just... <laughs> Mathematics is very impressive for the number of things that we don't know, and the number of relatively... Uh, you know, it it it's 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 it, it's hard to it's hard to think about mathematics hard for a year without kicking over several different questions that nobody knows the answer to that you're just shocked. Not you know, not only the the legendary important problems that nobody knows the answer to, but the things that you try and think about on your way towards them, where you stumble across just a mundane question, and you think, well, somebody must have answered this one already. It doesn't seem so bad, and and it just you know, it resists all attempts at being answered you know, both by you and by other people you ask about it. So I, I, it's impressive how little we know, I think, is my answer to that. So one thing about the mathematics then and now, I mean, in some sense, if Ramanujan would have come, let's say, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, he might have had an easier 
time because there was some kind of structure that Ramanujan seemed or maybe to have sort of had a better insight about how fundamental it was than Hardy has, which is this, uh, which also sort of appears in this uh, partition thing is the what's called the uh, uh, automorphic forms. The theory, this is somehow something which has the sort of we still somehow have some guesses about structures there that exist that we don't uh, have the slightest idea how to um, how to approach and sort of to some extent I think uh, Ramanujan would have been much happier with the current state of mathematics than he was uh, with at the uh, how the initial would stand. Yes, uh, Feynman um, said something in one of his books that I found kind of intriguing and I think is, is certainly true about mathematics. He said that if you want to know whether somebody um, is really an expert about something, what you should do is ask them you know, a few simple basic questions about, about their field and if they um, very soon uh, start stammering and stuttering and, and, and sounding very confused, then they probably actually know what they're talking about. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that um, the ways in which mathematics is uh, much more sophisticated now uh, than it was, let's say, 100 years ago, uh, I mean, it, it really is enormously more sophisticated. The machinery is enormously more sophisticated. So there are certain kinds of questions we would never have imagined asking which we can answer. But most of the questions that would occur to, let's say, a, a curious high school student um, that we can answer now, we could answer 100 years ago. And the ones we couldn't answer, we still can't. That's a great question. I don't know what kind of, um, I mean, he left, clearly he left the last, the notebook from the last year of his life was preserved, right? And that was while he was in Madras, what is now Chennai. So someone was keeping things. Um, I don't know if anyone has done any work um, with any archives in India on his, um, you know, what, what might be there? Does anybody know? Siddharth, do you know something? Interesting but, because the film portrayed so many letters that were saved. You know, um, I don't know if his letters have been saved. Uh, yeah, the, the, the comment from, from 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 a colleague in the front row is just that having read the book, there is not much evidence in the book that this is based on of a real available archive of photos or letters or documents from his life. And so I think I think you know. You know, we, we may end up partly with the British gaze because that's what's documented, which is not necessarily forgive taking that angle and doesn't necessarily forgive the fact that that's the result of colonial history. But we may be stuck with that and that, that, that we don't really have any great insight into, into his life. I mean, there could be insights into what the lives of other Tamil people 
of roughly the same class and caste were at the time, but I, I don't know that we have profound documentation of Ramanujan per se. It would be great if we did. Sidra, do you have another comment? Yeah, it, it actually um, distracted me throughout the entire film. I kept thinking, um, what is he living on? You know, because we, we didn't see, you know, we only saw him rejecting the food once in that hall, and then we saw him throwing the food out in his own room. And I, I mean, what did he live on for five years? Well, he clearly got sick and died. Um, He became, right, he became so susceptible to infection. And so it was very painful to see the split between body and mind, I think, in this film. Um, he was a genius. He was getting absolutely no sustenance, um, apart from this very transcendent relationship that he had. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very sad story. You know, one really wonders what he would have done had he gotten enough to eat. Um, Pardon? Just, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I don't mean to make light of it, but, but you know, it is, it, is, it is a tragedy that, that this is why we didn't get more. In the middle there? I suspect it's a bit of a hyperbole, to be honest with you. Yes, if there's any truth to it, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> and I agree with Alon. <laughs> So, 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 so it is an interesting question, and I, I know what answer the film was setting up, right? So the question is, would he have been more productive had he not had to prove things? And I think it is a, a common fantasy among students of mathematics and mathematicians that, oh, I could only have so many better ideas if I didn't have to prove them. And, I, um, <laughs> um, and, and, and you know, the, the movie's answer to the question is, is, of course, Littlewood's answer to the question, which is when he wasn't proving things, he was sometimes wrong. Um, and, and, you know... In this instance with Ramanujan, we only say sometimes wrong, but you know, I mean, we're all wrong often enough. And, and in mathematics, the only test is whether or not you're right or wrong is proof. And, and so, you know, maybe he could have written down many more beautiful things, many of which would have turned out to be true. But I think there are still many, many things in his notebooks that we don't know if they're true or false, um, even now. And, you know, unless you know the answer, they're just pretty formulas in a notebook. So that's my response. I don't know if other. I have a question about that. So, could someone else take the notebooks and try to prove them? Is that? Yeah, I mean it's an industry. Actually, when when I was uh, number theory editor of the Transactions of the American Mathematical Society, I used to get a certain number of submissions 
proving results from Ramanujan's notebooks. And um, I mean, there's a community of people who do this. It wasn't clear how, how much we wanted to publish of this. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an industry. Um, there was a story about blind men seeing an uh, elephant. Each one sees a small part. And I think somehow what's behind these formulas is much more interesting than the formulas themselves. Somehow this, what, there was something that, there was some part of the elephant that Ramanujan observed was sort of very different from what other people of his time observed and probably very different from what anyone has observed so far. And I think that part is sort of more interesting in uh, many ways than the formula. And I'm not so sure if that part has been uh, really understood and somehow internalized. One thing which is clear is that Ramanujan was more different from the other uh, in, in, from the English mathematicians than the English mathematicians were from each other. And that makes him very interesting to a mathematician, right? He's doing something really different, and that's exciting. Uh, at the same time, um, when you start comparing him to somebody like Euler, as the uh, movie did, it's clear that he ha had nothing like the impact on mathematics, nothing like uh, of Euler, and, and there's been speculation. What if he had had a, a normal education? You know, what if he had gone? You know, what if he had gone to uh, Trinity when he was 18 instead of going uh, 10 years later? Of course, nobody knows, and there's been a lot of speculation about it. Um, Yes, for those who didn't catch that, it was a remark to November's election. I feel that elephant is in every room, and if we talked about it every time it was in the room, we wouldn't talk about anything else. Um, so I'm happy to have an opportunity to talk about other things. Um, well, clearly the mother was a widow. Um, she was not in widow's whites, which would have, I mean, she was a very religious woman, clearly, so she actually normally would have had a shaved head and been in widow's whites. Um, it was very strange that there were no, like there was no extended family. Um, uh, and I think if they had been, I mean, that was speculation, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> um, but it was very strange that the women would not have gotten close or even liked each other during the time when he was away. She, she, you know. uh, so I, the answer to the question, I, I don't know, because it's very, um, to me, not realistic that they would have been alone like that. And then when the mother shared the news that he had become a fellow or his first publication came out, um, there were many women around. So, I mean, I think they were being cared for by a community which we did not see in the film, is what, it, is what my, my guess would be. My suspicion is that the part regarding Ramanujan's wife was not so uh, connected to reality. As far as I read, Ramanujan's wife was somehow, was an arranged marriage and she was 12 or 13 or something when she and probably much junior to Ramanujan in his years. I, I would be not too surprised if that part was not very accurate. I believe that part is accurate, and I even think they, um, I had my doubts about the timeline, so I looked it up. I believe, I believe that part is fairly accurate. I, 
I'd be speculating, but I suspect he didn't take it with him. I mean, he was in England for five years, and I don't think he was tubercular. I mean, I don't. Maybe you know something about tuberculosis, which I don't. So, 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 so all I can do is speculate. I, I just don't know. So um, the questioner is referring to the practice that the British um, really made a strong movement, uh, particularly Brit British feminists made a strong movement against the practice called sati, where um, women would, would walk into their husband's funeral pyre. Um, that, I think by that time, was less practice, but also, I think, that that cast, they were Tamil Brahmins, and they were, um, I, you know, I, I, does anybody know whether Brahmins do not practice sati? Yeah? Yeah. And where widow, widow whites, yeah. So I don't know what castes practice sati. Um, but it was blown way out of proportion by um, British colonial regime because it was something uh, kind of pagan. It was seen as kind of a heathen and pagan, right? So I don't know what the reality is of, of which castes practice that. I, I think I've been told that we're already done for the night, so I'm going to stop us here. Thank you very much.